Okay. Sense. Okay. Very good. So um, I'll start. And uh, I hope that um, everyone can hear me. Can I say um, hello to everyone? Everyone who's joined, and uh, I'm aware that there are other people that are continuing to join, and it's wonderful to see you all um, at this seminar. So, welcome to this seminar, which is um, organized and run by the Department of Educational Research at Lancaster University. And this is the latest in a series of seminars that are regularly run each year. And now, of course, they're completely in online format. And I'm delighted to be the chair of this seminar. Uh, I'm Don, Don Patsy. Uh, I'm a professor in the department here and the director of the doctoral program for e research and technology enhanced learning. So welcome to you all uh, for what I'm sure is going to be a stimulating and interesting seminar. Um, and it's on a topic I think that's very, very pertinent to our current contexts. Um, before I make a start, I need to say a little about housekeeping first. Um, even though we're not in an on-site environment, um, the online does still uh, require a bit of housekeeping from us. Just to say that the seminar is being live streamed um, for those of you that are off campus, whether you're uh, postgraduate students with us, staff, or just interested in this session. Um, you will be able to comment and ask questions during the session, and I'd ask you to use the chat facility for that. And you will be able to ask direct via voice or video at the end of the presentation. Um, for those comments and questions that you post during the presentation, I will view those as they come in. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll take those comments and questions from the chat facility before I open up to the floor for the rest of you to make further comments or to ask further questions. I should also say that this session is being recorded and the recording will be available on the department website in due course. Um, could I ask you, if you don't wish to be seen on the recording, please do make sure that your, that your video is turned off. Um, so can you all now please um, switch off your camera and mute your microphone during the presentation? Um, I can also check this uh, so that we can make sure that the presentation is as accessible to everyone as possible. So please do do that now if you would. Okay, so it's now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this seminar. Um, I'd like to introduce Olga, Olga Rotar. Um, she's a doctoral researcher here in the Department of Educational Research. And as you may have read from her, her short uh, biography, prior to her doing full-time doctoral research here, she was a distance learning specialist at the University of Economics in St. Petersburg in Russia. She's a member of the Center for Higher Education Research and Evaluation, um, and her research interests focus on exploring practices and engagement in online education, in adult education, concerned with internationalization and marketization of higher education and epistemic justice. I'm very fortunate. Uh, I'm fortunate to be Olga's academic supervisor, and I'm really delighted that Olga is willing to share details about her study, uh, which is a phenomenological study, and to outline her findings with you at this stage of her research. Um, Olga will present for about 50 minutes, and the title of her presentation is In Their Own Words, From Their Own Perspective, Adult Students in Online Higher Education. So, Olga, I thank you for being willing to present this seminar. So please do now offer us your perspectives on your study, which is clearly focused on a topical and contemporary concern. So please do start whenever you wish. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for such a great introduction. 
Uh, indeed, today I'm going to present my doctoral, doctoral project, uh, which is phenomenographic study. And that's why the title of my presentation is In Their Own Words, From Their Own Perspective, Adult Students in Online Higher Education, because I will be specifically focused on talking about how adult learners experience their learning in online higher education and how they perceive their academic success. I will start with uh, uh, outlining the research context and problem, and then I will talk a little bit about literature review gaps and research questions. Uh, usually I talk a lot about literature review and gaps, but today I decided to focus my attention on um, describing conceptual framework, which allowed me to, uh, which guided me through my uh, phenomenographic data, phenomenographic uh, project. And then I will talk about methodology itself and its data collection, data analysis procedures. Uh, after that, I will briefly introduce you to my findings and I will do it briefly because um, later I would like to um, discuss findings using three analytical frames, which I developed, which I employed in my, in my research. And lastly, I will discuss how I use theories and theoretical, different theoretical concepts at different stages of interpreting my data. So you will see later that it, for one research question, I employed theory in uncovering um, the nature of variations which I found. And in the research question two, which was focused on the phenomenon of success, I bring theory at the stage of philosophical discussion of how people can actually conceptualize success and how they can see success and what kind of consequences uh, can be if they don't follow success which is determined by their own values. So let me start. The rationale of my study is um, uh, shaped by the concerns that exist in online higher education. So although it has been suggested that um, online learning mode is uh, it's, uh, it's convenient and beneficial for adult learners. There is still a big concern regarding uh, how adult learners transit and what kind of challenges they face when adapting to online higher education. And the majority of online learners do not graduate. And although it's quite strong statement and there are no clear data about what are graduation rates and what are attrition rates from online higher education, mainly because of the inconsistency in dis, um, determining, in defining what is dropout, at, at which stage we need to decide if students succeeded or failed. However, some anecdotic evidence suggests that indeed uh, dropout rates are much higher in online programs compared to uh, traditional face-to-face -face programs. And this is what Simpson refers to as distant education deficit. Moreover, the extensive rit literature review shows that there are no single set of factors, no single set of elements that might explain why students uh, and how they progress in their programs and why they decide to drop out or to, per to persist. And moreover, uh, existing theoretical models on different um, uh, on students' attrition, retention, progress or success are also failing to address that phenomenon, a phenomenon of student drop dropout. And um, as Woodley and Simpson say, the phenomena of dropout is still remains an elephant in the room. Everybody knows about it, and, but nobody can do anything about it. To better understand what is the current um, uh, situation in the field of research in terms of experience of learning and online higher education by learners, by adult students, and what is, a currently, what is currently known about students' attrition, retention, and success in online higher education. I examined through the systematic literature review to these areas. And as you can see on the slide, I was specific specifically focused on understanding what kind of approaches has been used, have been used to dig deeper into the problem, into the issue. And what are factors or elements have been suggested as being influential either on students' attrition, retention, or success, or on the way how adult learners experience their online learning. Uh, in, 
specifically, I also was looking at the uh, way how evident learners are conceptualized, how they discussed in different studies, and whether the discussion about adult learner, learner population is still underpinned by historical assumptions uh, about distant learners. In the area of research on the students' attrition, retention, and success, as you can see, there were great variety of factors, which is difficult to classify and categorize. The picture is quite complex, and moreover, the results are often contradictory. So one study suggests that one particular factor has, has significant impact on uh, student persi students' persistence or decision to uh, persist or withdraw. While other study confirms through statistical analysis that there are no, no uh, correlation at all. Uh, and when I was looking of, on, on how students are conceptualized, I noticed that there is a still there is a huge oversimplification of adult learner population, which is actually not surprising because the majority of these studies uh, employed qual uh, quantitative approach. And to, to be able to use statistical analysis, data should be, um, the, the population should be actually simplified or simplified and divergent cases should be excluded because they don't fit into the um, nice statistical analysis. At the same time, when I was looking at different approaches, I realized that uh, students' attrition, retention, and success has been largely discussed from the perspectives of scholars, educators, or policymakers. And there were not enough studies. There's lack of interest in understanding how success is perceived or interpreted by learners themselves. And I got an interest in it when I read uh, arts, an article conducted by uh, a study conducted by uh, tutors from fully online programs in the UK Open University, who actually found that some students are happy and satisfied by their learning experience, even when they drop, even when they're dropping out from the course, by uh, pointing out that uh, their amazing transformation and that they got out of study as much as they could and they don't need the diploma. So I was thinking maybe there is something missing in our discussion about academic success and about um, how we can support learners in their learning journey and what is important for them. Uh, in the area of um, adult learners' experiences in online higher education, I was able to identify four major group of factors and 15 sub-factors, 15 sub which is also quite a complicated picture. And those factors or these elements are suggested to be highly influential on learners' experience in, in their online programs to um, different extents. What I also noticed that in, this, in these studies, there's also a tendency to um, uh, simplify, to oversimplify that homogeneous uh, um, uh, adult student, students' population and discuss them as a homogeneous group with specific characteristics. And these characteristics are mainly shaped by historical assumptions about adult learners, which came from adult learning theory, from andragogy. At the same time, all there many studies were in, in, in the area of um, exploring learners' experience. Uh, many studies were looking at um, learners' voices. It was lack of interest in the variations of uh, in how people experience, how learners experience their, their learning. So all the diversity had been somehow discussed in the beginning of the empirical study. At the end of the study, it still, it still was uh, not fully taken into account. And I think in, the, in terms of, uh, if you want to understand the way how to support learners, we need to take the diversity into the account and we need to bring it into the research design at every step of, of the research study. And this will be my main argument uh, during this presentation. So I was able, as I mentioned earlier, slightly mentioned earlier, I was able to identify three major gaps in relation to my study. Of course, there were, there were other limitations, but in relation to my study, uh, I noticed that the diversity of adult learner population is still neglected. And although there is emerging discussions of, of the uniqueness of each and every adult learner's profiles and the uniqueness of their backgrounds and previous experience, and this is noticeable if you look at different 
theoretical models, and if you look at the systematic literature review, what factors are influential um, in regard to, in terms of learning experience. So it's, it's, it's kind of acknowledged, but when it comes to actual empirical study, the diversity is still not taken, not fully taken into account. And only a few studies are specifically looking at variations in how people experience their learning and how they conceptualize their success. In addition, I could not find um, any interest in in-depth understanding of differences and similarities uh, in the learner's experience and perceptions. And by in-depth, I mean really looking deep into the student's reflection and uncovering what are the nature of these variations and how important different contexts, um, what kind of role of different contexts on how learning is experienced and how success is conceptualized by students. Uh, and therefore, my study aims to uncover, uh, to shed light on two phenomena. One phenomena is related to online learning, and another phenomena is related to how con success is conceptualized or perceived. So there are three questions, and they're very phenomenography-specific questions, are following. What are the qualitative differences in how adult learners experience their postgraduate learning? in two universities, one is in the UK and one is in Russia. A second research question is, what are qualitatively, qualitatively different ways in which adult learners perceive their success? And this is phenomena too. And lastly, I'm looking at the potential um, relationship between these two phenomena. Specifically, I wanted to look and see if the way how students experience learning can influence their perception of success. And if we have, as educators, can actually change their perception of success from more simplistic understanding of what learning can bring to a more extended, more powerful way. In my study, to, uh, to guide me for my study and to show the, the reader, the people who will be uh, uh, in, encountering my research, uh, what kind of concepts and what kind of um, philosophical ideas I included um, when I was conducting my, um, my phenomenographic study, um, I brought these ideas and conceptions into the conceptual framework. So this framework helps me to take the complexity of things I, I take in, into account into the, um, into the, uh, yeah, into the one common, common um, place. So I will be able not only take them into account, but actually also reflect on them and see um, uh, and check myself whether I'm following or not, or I'm falling into the assumptions which are um, not very useful in conducting phenomenographic study. So within that framework, I provide the reader with information how I approach my research project and um, what are the philosophical ideas I employ and follow. So let's start with the first concept, learning. Learning as a conception. So why in many learning theories, uh, learning is commonly understood from a cognitive or incentive perspective. In phenomenography, learning as a conception is associated of, with ways of seeing the phenomena, of seeing something, ways of experiencing something. So in other words, uh, looking at different way of conceptualizing learning, is will be in phenomenography, we'll be looking at different way of uh, how people are aware of their learning. And uh, in my study, I was looking how that awareness was expanding. So it was very important for me to show that there is expansion of awareness from more simplistic understanding of what learning is to a more complex and more powerful way of understanding. And in order to be to do so, I, I needed to describe that in phenomenography, learning is actually understood in a different way from how it's understood in uh, learning theories. Uh, I also employed um, concepts from exper experiential learning theory by Kolb. And uh, specifically, I took into account two philosophical ideas from this theory. The first one is um, the idea of the wholeness of learning experience, which is uh, 
that learning should be understood as a growth producing uh, process, which goes not only within, within higher education institution, but can also cover other dimensions, other areas of students' lives. Uh, and second, second philosophical idea that I took from experiential learning theory is that, uh, that when we discuss learning through experience, we should take into account individual differences, individual values, individual backgrounds, and this should be implemented in the way how we analyze how learning is experienced. And of course, one of the uh, main, and it's probably main uh, concept in my study is adult learner. And uh, I look at this concept from the, uh, through the critical analysis of historical assumptions about adult learners, which mainly came from the adult learning theory, andragogy. However, I wanted not only to criticize uh, assumptions about learners and principles developed for, uh, for adult learners, but also to show that the father of andragogy, Knowles, he also was uh, proposing that adult learners are different and they may vary in the level of self-direction and they have different profiles, different backgrounds. So the idea of the, the role, the job of educator is to actually help learners to become more self-directed. Uh, so I wanted to uncover, I wanted to bring that a statement that argument of Knowles to the uh, to the front of uh, my discussion about adult learners and lastly I'm using uh, two a few concepts from different theories from self-direction theory I employ concept of innate psychological needs and I will be um, uh, using it, it as a theoretical a theoretical lens at the stage of uncovering and explaining dimensions of variation that exist among learners in how they experience learning. And I also discussed two concepts uh, in relation to the motivation and um, uh, direction, orientation of motivation, which is intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Why I, do I need to focus my attention here? Uh, in, in my study, I found that motivation can be different and students behave in a different way and experience learning in different way. Um, in terms of how, uh, how they are motivated from within or from outside. However, self-determination theory allowed me to, to find out, to, to be aware that there are different types of extrinsic motivation. And although some of them are harmful and can, um, can uh, slow learner down and put, it, put them off from their learning activity, some of them can be internalized some extrinsic motivators, motivators which comes from educators, if they, approached, if they approached learners in the right way, they can be internalized and can be aligned with the learners' values and beliefs and therefore make learning beneficial for them. At the same time, when I looked at the concept of extrinsic motivation, I wanted to be more aware for myself, I wanted to also see what is the nature of intrinsic motivation and how can we support learners' motivation from within. within. And self-determination theory allowed me to uh, look at, allowed me to identify three psychological, three major psychological needs, innate psychological needs that must be satisfied in order for a learner to, to achieve the growth producing experience and to be fully satisfied with learning. Uh, at the stage of discussing uh, the notion of success and variations in how people perceive success, I employed capability approach by Sen. So it was a different way of employing, of bringing theory into phenomenographic study. And I only used it at the stage of discussing philosophically what are the differences, you know, why it's important to uh, follow individuals' valued outcomes and how it can uh, and has their well-being and uh, broader social uh, social justice. And as you can see, there is also reflective practice framework. You will see that framework several times in my presentation, uh, which means that I'm not only discussed uh, this concept somewhere in my 
piece of thesis and piece of research, but I was actually constantly reflecting on them and constantly being uh, was constantly aware of how I guide research, how I analyze data, and how I interpret what I heard from from students. So why I choose phenomenography? So phenomenography worked quite well in my research, in my particular study, due to its specific aims, focus on variations, due to its specific uh, sample population, uh, which are adult students with a variety of backgrounds, and due to its specific, um, um, due to my study specific aims and objectives. But also I wanted to emphasize that phenomenography uh, has been developed uh, by educational researchers for educational researchers uh, to assist them to understand what are the differences in how students experience their learning or experience some con conceptualize their learning and various aspects of the learning phenomena. In the, at the same time, uh, what was very attractive to me in phenomenography is that uh, it looked at learners' experience from the second order perspective. So phenomenography had a close interest in understanding learning um, from in eyes and in words of students from their own perspective and their in their own words. So I, I as a researcher need to put my knowledge and my assumptions on the uh, somewhere else, leave them aside, and purely focus on how learning learning is experienced by by students, even if it does not make any sense for me. Um, also, as you can see, there are some uh, ontological and some epistemological uh, um, assumptions in, in phenomenography, which uh, I should probably mention. So, as I, as I said earlier, phenomenography um, presumes second order perspective, but also it's non dualistic, it has non dualistic stance, which means that um, phenomenographers, phenomenographers um, presume that there is, there is only world which is experienced by person. And if you want to understand the world better, we need to hear how a person is experiencing the world. So phenomenographers, phenomenographers do not, um, uh, they reject objectivity and they focus on how how world is experienced by, by the person. Uh, I will not go through all steps of data analysis of phenomenography. Uh, it's actually quite a simple process, although there are many steps of conducting data analysis. Uh, it's quite a simple process. Uh, what I would like to say is that I could not find any straightforward guidance of how to conduct, uh, step, how to conduct data analysis step by step, apart from the uh, framework um, by uh, Sjönström and Dahlgren. And, they suggested seven steps of data analysis. But as you can see, here is another step. I added another step in yellow, uh, which called identification of dimensions of variation. Uh, so in phenomenography, we are not only looking at different ways of how a phenomena is experienced or perceived, but we also look at the structural aspects of the phenomena. So in which, uh, which what are dimensions of variation? So we dig deeper we identify additional elements of the phenomena which, which can explain the differences in main way, ways of experiencing learning or in my case success. And I couldn't find any guidance on how to identify, how to dig deeper, how to identify structural elements of the phenomena. So I had to adapt the, uh, the framework proposed by offers and um, uh, to, in, in, when doing so, in, for each step of data analysis, I was um, introducing the aim of, this, of the analytical process and I was describing a uh, procedure of what I was doing in details in order to show uh, how I was following that, uh, how, how I was working with data. At the same time, I developed the guidance for my own purposes, for my own use, uh, reflective practice guidance, uh, for each step where I was asking myself specific questions and um, this allowed me not to be not to follow not to fall into some particular assumptions and to look at data from students perspective not from my own perspective 
when I was collecting data, and this is quite a, uh, quite quite a long story, and I want I will share it with you uh, if you want later after finishing my presentation. So data collection in my case was quite challenging, and uh, it requires careful planning. So I would recommend people to uh, to to actually to plan carefully how you will collect data and how you approach. Uh, study participants, but I think it's a common common uh, problem, common issue for any any research. Uh, when collecting data, I was also following some evaluation procedures, which I also developed for myself, uh, because I could not find um, any way of how I can how I can address the uh, issues of how I can basically explain the reliability and validity of my data. So in order to do so, I developed that, these evaluation procedures, uh, which were uh, testing, uh, which, was, which I was checking how my research question match uh, uh, interview questions, and um, whether I ensure that the diversity of my sample replicate the diversity of online learners in a broader context, uh, adult learner population. And uh, when designing interview questions, I was focused on what kind of follow-up questions are used and whether I was using indirect way of exploration. So rather than asking students directly how they experience learning and how they perceive success, I was trying to in trigger their reflection process so they will be able to uncover something which, is, which they were not aware of themselves. And of course, in phenomenography, it's important not to influence the uh, way how discussion is going or how phenomenographic interview is going. So I was trying to be focused and reflect on my on my own interventions and I was minimizing uh, my um, the, the influence how I was minimizing the way how interview goes by not commencing and not bringing my own perspective into the, into the discussion. And of course there were challenges in communication and this is also common limitation in many studies, in many in, in different approaches. Um, I was learning um, how to sp speak about topics which might be uh, quite sensitive in a way that uh, it allows students to be open and um, uh, share with me more. So basically, you need to learn the principles of, of communication. Uh, before conducting phenomenographic study. And the pilot study is actually a very good way to, to do so. So before conducting full-length study, it's a good idea to conduct pilot study and see and test your, your skills and uh, develop some uh, ability and some awareness. Uh, I mentioned a reflective practice framework that I developed. So what is it? I used uh, some particular reflective instruments and as you can see, it's a reflective diary. This is what I used in the early stage of my, of my research until I um, launched my academic blog. It's called Academic Journey Blog. So in that blog, I was reflecting on how I analyze data, how I develop my conceptual framework. I was posting different, uh, different uh, ways of uh, thinking about data and uh, how I will be. I was reflecting on my interview process I was noticing my mistakes and, and what I've done wrong. So I was developing and evolving as a researcher when I was reflecting on my blog. But also my conceptual framework was evolving and the uh, outcome space or phenomenographic model was evolving. And I was documenting it in my, in my blog posts. And uh, the model you will see at the end is a final model, but I had five more models for first research question before. So it's actually a very good um, tool to see how your, um, your understanding of your own data is evolving if you write, if you keep the academic block. I was also participating in different events, uh, like symposium, which was focused on positionality and subjectivity in phenomenographic research. And I was working on the paper. So these activities actually helps you to develop as a phenomenographer, which is very important if you are, if you're doing, if you're a novice phenomenographer and if you are doing it alone as a, as a sole researcher. And, um, also, it's a very good idea and will give you strong confidence in your ability to conduct phenomenographic study uh, if you go through the phenomenographic research training and if you actually will be able to work with data and uh, get some feedback from 
from more experienced phenomenographers of how you uh, about your ability and about how, what you need to be aware when when you work with phenomenographic data so now let me introduce you to my findings very briefly and then we i will discuss them in more detail uh, through the analytical frameworks i employed So my research question one was aimed to um, uncover various ways of how people, how adult, learner, adult learners experience their learning in online higher education, in their online postgraduate programs. And uh, I was able to ident identify three main ways of experiencing learning. Uh, learning as an investment, learning as a process that brings structure to different dimensions to life, work, and experience. And you can see there are subcategories in this category two. And the category three is online learning is a process that enables and empowers. And there are also two subcategories. So learning enables in terms of professional development and learning empowers in, in regard to professional growth and professional, uh, oh, sorry, personal growth and personal development. You can see that uh, there are three main areas, and in phenomenography they're called dimensions of variation within each category. So there are, and these dimensions of variation have been noticeable across all categories. So I I noticed that in category one, in different categories, students' motivation is different, and the role of interactions with others is also different and the outcomes of their learning is also different. So the way how they experience learning actually determined by their motivation, by their relatedness to other people, and by their anticipated outcomes or outcomes that they, 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 they actually happy about. And here, this, this is a place where I bring concepts of innate psychological needs and external and internal motivation. When I was talking about psychological, uh, innate psychological needs, um, I mentioned that these psychological, the, the, the needs are, can only be, these needs can be only satisfied if their students, um, student need for relatedness, autonomy, and connectedness is satisfied. And uh, this is a main uh, proposition of self-determination self theory, which ha has been extensively cited. It has more than 34,000 citations and it, was, it has been extensively tested and employed in different areas. So in terms of motivation, uh, if you want to support students better, if you want to help them to exp experience uh, growth and development with the learning, and this is amazing proposition of self-determination de theory that through learning, we can actually enhance learners' well-being and uh, uh, support their growth and development. So if you want to do that, we need to uh, help them to satisfy their needs for connectedness, relatedness, and autonomy. And people might have different, as you can see in my, in my outcome space, there are different needs of autonomy, different needs of relatedness to other people in terms of interaction. Um, and therefore, the outcomes can be also different. The focus can be also different. In terms of motivation, you can also see that motivation is changing from the more simplistic way of understanding learning as an investment, which is external motivation, to a more uh, powerful, more broader, more, um, more complex way of understanding learning um, as a process that enables and empowers. Uh, and motivation there is internal and it's, uh, it's, uh, a student is driven from within. A student is driven by uh, his or her developmental needs. And learning is a process that, uh, that helps him or her with that. Uh, in that, uh, yeah, so by identifying three areas of, uh, of focus, it's important also to, no to, to notice that this is our elements, uh, they called structural elements of experience. So referential elements of experience are the main ways of looking at the phenomena, experiencing the phenomena. In my case, there are three ways. Structural aspects, it's something that we go deeper 
and structural aspects have not only dimensions, dimensions of variation, but can also explain us why people have different motivations and why there are different um, needs for interaction with others and why there are different outcomes. And uh, the concept, the idea of external and internal horizons can help us with that. So analytical framework that helped me to identify referential aspects or basically the main dimensions of variation and help me to identify structural aspects. Those, uh, uh, sorry, the, the referential aspect, the main ways of experiencing learning and structural aspects, the main dimension, dimensions of variation, but also structural aspects explain against which context, within which, which context um, these differences occur. So why people experience it, experiencing learning in different ways against which background. And in my research question one, I was able to see through the in-depth analysis of rich data that in the category one, learning as an investment is experienced in the, in the uh, context of uh, labor market. So the background against which that feature of the phenomena, that benefit of online learning is not, has been noticed by students was shaped uh, and maybe limited by the labor market and by the opportunity to uh, get benefits uh, on the labor market in the future. In the category two, the context against which, against which learning um, has been experienced um, was already a bit broadened. So it's not only um, not only focus simply on the labor market, on, on, on um, instrumental outcomes of learning, but also people saw the influence of learning in, in, in the broader life. So they see how learning brings structure to their life, how it reshapes the way how they uh, schedule their activities. It influences their routine. So the context against which, or background against which the learning is experienced is completely different in the category two. And um, the idea of external horizon I was referring to help us to understand why, why it's happening, why it's so. In the category three, I'll just mention last category in terms, of, in terms of contextual difference. In the category three, learning is already experienced um, in the context of broader societal impact and influence. So how students can uh, so learning is actually something that can assist people to uh, make some contribution to the, bride, to the wider society, which is completely different uh, and much more extended background and context against which learning is experienced. And the idea of external horizon and external horizon came from the uh, field theory of consciousness uh, developed by Aaron Gurich, American psychologist, uh, who was saying, who, who, who described, who explained that people can experience things, things differently based on what comes to the foresee, to the front zone of their awareness. So people can see the same phenomena, but, can, but some particular features of the phenomena uh, might be in the front of awareness of one person, while other person might notice different features of the phenomena. And if you want to understand the phenomena better, we need to see different features of the phenomena by, by the eyes of different people, different groups of people. So what comes to the front of the awareness called theme, and Martin and Booth brought, took this idea of theme and call it internal horizon, the focus, the main way of experiencing something. And the thematic field and margin from the field theory of consciousness uh, is associated with external horizon or a background which shapes the way how we see the world. So that structural framework actually helped me to, um, well, it's it actually explained why there are different, you know, why do we need, how, how we can, can actually identify different elements of experience. And until I started to dig deeper into the field theory of consciousness, of consciousness of Aaron Gurich, I had no idea of how other phenomenographers identify and explain internal and external horizon, which is quite, um, 
quite surprising, um, quite surprising uh, limitation of the past research. And probably because um, of the lack of time and lack of space um, in describing the way how other phenomenographers conducting their research, they tend to miss this black box of data analysis uh, outside of the publications. Also, I was looking, I was employing analytical framework uh, called the structure of awareness framework. And this framework helped me to explain later on in my, in my data interpretation, uh, why I talk about expansion of awareness. And one of the assumptions of phenomenography is that different ways of experiencing or perceiving the phenomena are associated with different features of awareness that come to the foresee or to the front, um, front area of individual's awareness. And at the same time, different, way, uh, different variations in, in, ways, in ways of experiencing are associated with variations in identifying particular features of the phenomena. So in other words, and I'll go back to my findings. In other words, uh, this is an explanation why uh, category one is embedded in uh, category two and both these categories are embedded in category three. So this is how I wanted to show you that students' awareness is, uh, is expanding. So in the category one, there was a very narrow focus on learning as an instrument for getting some return of, of invest, investment. In the category two, students of course value outcomes of learning in terms of diploma and of course they value opportunity to benefit on the labor market but they more talking and more focused on how learning structure their lives uh, how it makes their lives work and their knowledge more effective more organized and how they uh, are able to shape and reshape their previous opinions and um, able to reflect on what they knew before. And in the category three, you can see uh, the category three contains all previous categories uh, as a more complex and more powerful way of understanding learning. Uh, and the hierarchical, hierarchical structure was quite visible in my data. So it might not always be visible when you collect data, but if you uh, got rich data and if you uh, managed to ask follow-up questions that initiated reflection, it's quite visible in data how learners' awareness is increasing when they talk about uh, different benefits of their online learning. I'll show you the last I'll show you the, the research question too. When I was looking at the students' perception of, perceptions of success, I was able to identify five different categories and four, uh, two main areas which varied across each category. Uh, and as you can also see, uh, I showed that how students' awareness was expanding from more simplistic understanding of success as something which can be measured by formal criteria, by grades, by results of the assignment to a more complex understanding success success as understanding in action so when people when the student can, was actually able to apply what he or she learned on practice success as an improvement in work you do so how theories and learn tools improved persons uh, professional practice how it allowed him or uh, him or her to be more professional more more effective at work Category four is success as an opportunity to open doors. And category five is success as self-actualization. And you can see here that the concept, the way how students talk about success is actually becoming more complex, more expansive, and more elements of learning are of, of benefits, of outcomes of learning becoming more and more embedded. And the final category, success as self-actualization, is um, something that students are looking uh, for, although they might, you know, at, 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 the, at, the mark, at the highest stage of awareness, although they might also value, again, as I mentioned before, formal criteria, formal um, uh, attributes of online higher education, like diploma and high grades. 
And also, of course, the value to be part of community and to be able to open doors on the labor market and to improve in their work. But what they're actually uh, satisfied and what uh, they are following in the last more uh, most extensive understanding of success is personal development, not only within um, educational institution, but uh, across their lifespan and how they can um, they can how they can transform themselves and how they develop their own values to be uh, to be helpful and useful in a broader society. And at this stage of my research, I brought a discussion, philosophical discussion uh, of the concept capabilities approach uh, developed by Sen, Indian economist and philosopher. And uh, it's actually quite different way of, empl of uh, employing theoretical lens uh, in, in phenomenographic study because I was not um, describing the nature of variations and why there are differences in students motivation and how it changes as I did in previous research question. I was um, holding more philosophical discussion of how we as educators should rethink the concept, the term success and uh, how and what, what um, consequences can be if we won't follow the idea of success as valued by elite learners. And the consequences according to capabilities approach are quite negative uh, because if the individual do not follow personal values, the well-being cannot be achieved and the societal fairness and uh, social justice cannot be achieved. So it, it is very important to, uh, you know, if I, if, if I bring a discussion of, on capabilities approach, it is very important not to focus on widening participation for adult learners, but on widening capabilities for them. And this is uh, what Walker argues in her study from 2008. So you can see there are different ways of you can see there are different ways of uh, bringing theory into your phenomenographic study, and there are different ways of uh, using concepts to guide your data analysis, to guide your data uh, interpretation. Uh, and today I discussed. Uh, several concepts, several frameworks that I used at the stage of uh, data analysis and data interpretation again. Uh, some of them were hidden, so developed very well developed by hidden and not fully explained by phenomenographers. And some of them I had to develop myself just to be able to make my study transparent and uh, uh, accessible for the reader. Uh, and I hope my research results will be useful for others and uh, I hope somebody will, will learn and maybe contribute uh, to the discussion on how we can, uh, as educators, how we can support learners and how we, develop, how, how we can develop a better support system based on what is important for them and uh, based on the knowledge of how they experience their online learning. Uh, there are a couple of questions, uh, you know, I'm very happy to hear your questions, but if you, if you want to have some initial discussions, a discussion. I, um, we can start with uh, explanation of how I selected my study participants and uh, on my personal motivation. But I'm very welcome to hear questions from the from the from the audience. Okay. So thanks. Um, thanks. Thanks very much indeed, Olga, for that. Um, I'm now going to. Um, uh, there are, I think, one or two questions coming up. I was aware of one or two questions um, from the from the chat. First of all, I need to make an apology. <laughs> uh, I believe I said in the introduction that you were doing a phenomenological study, and of course that's not true. It was phenomenographic, and and well done to uh, Natalie Jane for picking that up. And I do apologise for that, and I'm sure I'm sure that you um, you you realised my mistake uh, as as we were going through. Um, the, there was one question about uh, the groups that you were using, i.e., your participant groups. But I think I think that was also clarified in terms of uh, what you said. Um, so um, we have a, a couple of questions that that uh, I can take from the the chat here. Uh, one is if you could expand a little on the use of the capability approach in order to analyze success. 
Uh, actually, I talk about it in my blog post. Mm -hmm. So I just bring the discussion, uh, philosophical discussion from capabilities approach uh, and talk about the importance of for educators to align what they expect from students to do in their learning, uh, what they expect students to produce as a result of their learning process uh, with their values, with their valued outcomes. So capability in terms of freeing participants to follow their own values, their freedom to choose what is important for them. Uh, and I, in my study, uncovered that there are different ways, different ways of valuing online learning, different anticipated outcomes. And if I discuss this from capabilities approach perspective, this means that we there's already there there are already identified differences, and it's our um, moral uh, obligation as educators to help people to follow their values, their valued outcomes. Uh, in order to enable societal uh, individual well-being and societal well-being and societal fairness and social justice rather than limiting what we expect from learning by neoliberal perspective by meritocratic neoliberal perspective mm. okay okay thank you for that okay so thanks to Gemma for that question and the next one is from is from Natalie Jane which and she's asking um, have you compared the results between the UK and the Russian cohorts? It was not comparative study, so I will start with that. Uh, and I, in my study, I actually explain that those two programs can be seen as identical in terms of um, a structure and in terms of tutors involved. So I was thinking to do comparative study in the beginning, but I decided to... Uh, um, to make it one single population, which is diverse in terms of not only age, previous academic background and uh, work experience, but also culturally diverse. And how it helped me. Uh, in UK university, there were students who were from European countries and in Russian university, there were students not only Russian, but students from post-Soviet Union countries. So this allowed me to bring, not only conduct study in two research sites, but also allowed me to bring the diversity perspective uh, from cultural point of view. And uh, no, no, I was not comparing because uh, it was not comparative study. Mm -hmm. But it will be interesting to compare, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks for that, Olga. Um, and we've got a, a question about the presentation slides, but, 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 but certainly I think those, those are made available as a part of, as a part of the recording. Um, so there's a question from, from Sally, which is to do with the sample. Um, uh, she'd be interested in how many students you interviewed and, and how you did those, whether you conducted them online, etc. Okay, it will be long answer. So um, I'll start with number of participants. So altogether I had 15 participants, which is quite a small number. And uh, I not in any case um, argue that my, my findings are, can be generalized on different programs and it was not intent of my study. What I wanted to do is just to provide some insights that there might be very different ways of experiencing learning and we actually have different instruments to dig deeper to look at learners' experience from a very, very uh, broad and deep perspective. So I had 50 study participants. And um, what was the next question, John? Uh, Don? Uh, it, was, it was to do with whether the interviews were conducted online or how you yeah. did those. Yeah. Yeah. I conducted all my interviews via Skype and some of them via WhatsApp calls if it was if Skype was not accessible. So I was just following uh, what was convenient to study participants. So it was all via internet. And I thought it's most appropriate way of conducting interviews because of the nature of uh, students learning. Uh, but also I was considering coming to the residential schools. So to be able to recruit my study participants, I had to go through the very complicated process, which involved several gatekeepers, including sponsor, you know, academic sponsor of my application. And I had to actually explain how my study will benefit to 
program and to study participants themselves. And I applied for participation of, on the residential school. And on the final stage, when I had to get final approval from a school director, residential school director, uh, they suggested me not to conduct, not to do it during the residential school. So I had to modify my idea of conducting face-to-face -face interviews very quickly. But it worked very well. People were quite relaxed. And in phenomenography, if you have a chance to have initial conversation with participant beforehand or you know, to try to, to introduce yourself and to make it uh, more uh, convenient for them and more comfortable for them to talk, like, for example, you know, select a convenient time and a very con a convenient place where they can sit and reflect, that will be the best. Okay, thanks for that, Olga. Um, and uh, a question, another question from Natalie Jane, which is, where would you advise seeking out phenomenographic research training? Yes, this is a very difficult question. I myself was looking extensively on different places and I'm so far only aware of two places, two institutions that provide training on phenomenography, well, three, including Lancaster University. But it's only for people who study in, in, um, in specific programs. So it's not publicly available. So one uh, training is provided by Society for Research in Higher Education. Uh, uh, and it runs once or twice a year. And uh, the University of, I won't be able to pronounce it correctly. So the Mark, Martin Ferran, the founder of phenomenography, is still working in, the, in Sweden, in the University of, in Sweden, in the uh, Department of Educational Research. And they have um, se uh, seminars and they have, it's not training, but it's seminar and um, uh, different discussion groups on how to conduct phenomenography. And I myself was planning to apply for, for my, uh, you know, as a part of my research training uh, program uh, to apply for the, for the grant to go to Sweden and to have this, to have an opportunity to meet Martin and um, to, to work with other phenomenographers on some, some data. Uh, but during the, due to the lockdown, I, I missed that opportunity. So yeah, Probably Society of Research and Higher Education is the best place to go. Yeah, I mean, certainly within the department here, um, Paul Ashwin is, is um, uh, a very experienced phenomenographer um, and, um, and, and has supported uh, many students in the department on that. So yeah. within our department, we're, we're, we're very fortunate in, in having someone who has that sort of level of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, but, so Don, Paul, Paul actually was um, running sessions in Society of Research and Higher mm -hmm. Education before, before Mike. And um, I wanted to sign up for Paul's uh, training uh, on phenomenography. And it will be very useful if he can either make it available for for all students who are expressing interest, or um, I myself is willing to share my experience if needed uh, in terms of how to conduct phenomenography and what are limitations and etc. So in our department, we have experienced phenomenographer Paul and we are very lucky, but mm -hmm. if, it, if, if you know, it will be helpful to make it more available for other students. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. And it's great that you're also willing to, to share your experience, which is, you know, everyone who does, who does research is, is, is able to expand on certain things. And, you know, you're having that opportunity to expand in certain ways and to look at analysis in particular ways, I think is very, very helpful for people. So being able to share that, I think, will be, will be very helpful. So you, you have some very nice comments here as well, Olga. There's a thank, thank you from you. Neil who says a fascinating and personally relevant study, and from Len Lenandler, who says uh, that uh, he's presently grappling with understanding outcome space and variations of experiences, and that your presentation was particularly helpful at this, uh, in this specific way. Uh, and thank from you. Steve, um, who says, thank you, a very clear presentation of your study, very helpful. Um, and from Natalie Jane also. And from Len, there is a question here. Um, so what is your advice to a newbie in working out the outcome space and variations of differences of understanding phenomenon? Uh, my first advice would be to read um, recent works of um, people who just done 
um, phenomenographic analysis and to look at the ways how they develop and how they explain the development of, out, of the outcome space. So in my case, I looked, I was reading the paper of um, Maria Sitajar. So I will cite our, one of our PhD students. And uh, in her paper, it was quite clear how she explained how she reached outcome space and how she explained different categories. Uh, so reading papers that are transparent about the way how the outcome space had been developing and it was developed is very helpful. So this is the first, uh, probably first step. And second step is to read books which are specifically focused on phenomenographic methodology. So in parallel of reading papers, which are kind of very brief, very uh, condensed uh, summary of uh, what is outcome space and how, how it has been developed, I suggest to look at the book, for example, Doing Developmental Phenomenography by Bo, uh, Bowen and, and Green. Uh, in this book, different phenomenographers explaining how they were conducting their research. So it's actually a book of, uh, which will uncover more the black box of phenomenographic data analysis, not in full. It's still not explaining the idea of, uh, you know, where external and internal horizon came from, which I had to read in the different book of Aaron Gurich, uh, The Field Theory of Consciousness. But this book helped me to um, understand uh, how to do step by step, uh, bit by bit, um, data analysis in order to be able to develop outcome space. Okay, thanks Olga. Um, you're clearly uh, generating a lot of a lot of comments and questions here, which is great. Uh, let's let's see how we can get through them. So, Sue Cranmer has, has indicated that she's unfortunately had to leave, but she she said she's found it really interesting and informative. So thank you thank for you, that. Sue. Um, and from Catherine, um, she says that she's doing research in a very similar area, and felt that learners' perspectives were also less foregrounded. Um, she's found that it is now being more focused in, in theses uh, such as yours. So her, her questions are, do you think the adult learning in voice will become a richer area of research? And do you have any thoughts on why? I guess it, um, the situation is actually changing now. So before adult learners were the majority of online student population. Now the situation is changing, more and more young people uh, coming to online education, but still adult learners will remain the largest group in an online higher education. So therefore, and it's my, it's like, it's my, my personal position is that if you want to understand um, online learning better, we need to focus on how it is experienced uh, by learners themselves. Um, why? why adult learners uh, require such a such a big focus it is mainly due because of their additional responsibilities so it's quite it's more easy to um, explain uh, uh, if there are less number less a number of factors which might influence learning process learning might be easier to explain and learner might be it will be might be easier to support the learner but when there are different types of factors that might influence the way how people learn and uh, different external factors such as job responsibilities, different commitments, uh, differences in the educational background, it's more difficult to develop a better support system because of the how diverse population is. So the focus should be now on the learners population in terms, of, in terms of their diversity, how we can ensure every uh, every person is supported uh, while having such a great diversity so this is a question we need to look at and how we need to not only uh, widen participation for adult uh, to bring adult in, in online higher education is is actually a very simple uh, uh, task because online learning is quite accessible but to ensure that learners do not drop and they actually progress and succeed this is what we need to look at and this is important because um, numerous studies showed on the what are the consequences of dropping out of, from uh, from education the how people experience frustration depression uh, even uh, the level of domestic violence is increasing uh, if people are not succeed ex experiencing uh, dropout it's mainly about face-to-face uh, -face programs but i i can i can see that this can be very easily related to online learning as well so 
many many uh, uh, consequences, negative consequences for adults uh, when they drop out. Uh, and how to help them, how to help such a diverse population to succeed is a very difficult task and we need to look more at it, I think. Yeah, and that actually relates very much to another question that you've had, um, Olga, which, which comes from Kadia. Uh, she thanks you for the presentation and she's asking you to elaborate a bit more on who the learners were, their gender, ethnicity, etc., and whether you were able to accommodate or whether you were able to look at these uh, differences when you were considering analysing. So my uh, the way how I um, recruited my study participants uh, was uh, through the special committee in those two universities. I was um, um, which were my research sites. So I identified in my um, uh, sample requirements that I need people with different backgrounds, with different uh, ethnic, ethnic backgrounds and educational backgrounds, uh, different uh, uh, cultural backgrounds. So this has been provided by the universities themselves, uh, itself. Uh, the, the diversity had been ensured by, by the university I was working with because they were also interested in, in uh, outcomes of my research. Um, in terms of um, the differences, they were, um, they were people from different professional areas, but who were interested in developing a better understanding of what theories and um, concepts they can use for their professional practice. So uh, I, was not, I was aware that there are differences in their background and their um, ethnicity and language, but I was not digging into it because it was not focus of my research. I was not, not interested on the influence of individual characteristics on the way how they experience online learning because this has been done in different statistical regression studies. And some studies actually found that there is no correlation between background, ethnicity, gender, et cetera, on how learning, learning is experienced. I was, uh, I was only aware of what I needed in my study just to bring together the group of, just to have a sample which more or less replicate the diversity of adults. And there were people who uh, replicate cultural diversity, not much ethnical diversity, to be honest, but uh, very diverse in terms of cultural background, in, ter in terms of previous education. And uh, this is how I approached um, the, the, my sample. So I was not interested in the influence of individual differences. It was not important uh, in, my, in my research. Okay, thanks Olga. Um, so uh, a comment from Lauren to, to, to thank you for um, an interesting talk. There's a question from John, which is, uh, which is an interesting one, slightly, slightly different topic here. Um, John's asking, did your personal experiences influence your choice for such a topic? Yes, I think yes. I think I had personal motivation uh, to conduct this research. Uh, not only I was working as a distant learning specialist in the University of Economics in St. Petersburg, before that I was working for a few years as an uh, assistant lecturer in the University of Civil Aviation. And uh, it's a university that provided um, distant learning programs, which are very traditional. Uh, they held in tradition of Soviet uh, distant education system. It was six or eight months distant learning programs. And I was working, I was delivering um, practical sessions for uh, people from different um, background, uh, from different professions within the, uh, within the aviation area. And some of them were people the technicians and some of them people from logistics department and some people were um, uh, highly um, educated with multiple certificates, air traffic controllers and pilots and uh, other, other uh, air crew. And I, was, I, became, I became committed to the idea that people actually cannot be, uh, cannot be treated in terms of, you know, uh, treated similarly and uh, um, uh, approached in the same way when they're so, so diverse. And some people were, because in my case, more people, uh, some people were engaged while others were just willing to listen and gain and absorb information I was giving them. Uh, others were ready to, to discuss and to reflect and to argue 
about what I was saying. So it was quite a different uh, experience I had. And I was exposed to, the, to these lectures a lot because I was a young lecturer and working with distance learners was the most difficult task in my university. Uh, I think that gave me an idea of we need to do something. We need to do something of how we structure our teaching practices, how we approach different learners and how we help them to uh, be more active, more engaged, how we can support them in the way of, of becoming a more active learners, more active agents of their learning. Uh, working as a distant learning specialist um, showed me that university, unfortunately, not often, not always willing to do radical changes in the way how they teach and how they uh, and also about support strategies they develop and this is mainly because adult learners do not complain if they don't succeed in online higher education they tend to blame th themselves for their failures and um, i agree with simpson and woodley that it's not the right approach i think universities should be responsible for for the ways how they support learners and it should be it's quite difficult to offer individualistic approach but one size fit all, fit all approach will not work either so i wanted to see you know in, in my study i wanted to find a limited number of ways, limited, limit, limited variations. Not, I'm not, I was not planning to list all the potential, all the possible vari variations and how learning experienced, but I want to map different areas which can be target, targeted in terms of support systems we can develop as educators. So I think, yes, I had strong personal motivation to do this research. Okay, thanks Olga. Um, so um, carrying on down the messages and the questions, uh, Sally thanks you for, for uh, uh, a very a very good, very useful uh, answer and uh, Daijuan thanks you for a, a wonderful presentation. Um, Barbara uh, felt that it was really insightful and um, she feels it will help her with her own study and uh, thank you from Natalie Jane. Um, there's a question from Zsa Zsa. Um, and she says um, that she understands you're looking at qualitatively different ways of conceptualizing online learning by adult learners. She's wondering how you um, discuss online learning context. Um, maybe you could maybe you could pick up on that and 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 expand on that a little. Where how you've considered online learning context in terms of of possible variation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you are right, you said that there are different ways of uh, um, defining what online learning is. So in my study, I just followed Alien and Simon's um, definition of online, of, of uh, uh, categorizing programs uh, on online, hi hybrid and um, traditional. And uh, uh, in my, so the programs I was looking at had more than 80% of content delivered via internet. So according to, of the topology, according to the topology offered by Alan and Simon, uh, I consider these programs as taught online. Um, all the, these programs, the programs I considered had taught elements in it. So there were residential schools, Residen residential schools held for four days for each model, module. And um, uh, during the residential schools, people was working on um, case studies on assignments and we were able to communicate and interact with tutors. And that's why in my study that um, theme, in, the role of interactions uh, with others came out because there were situations when they had chance to interact with others. Alternatively, in, my, in these programs, uh, there was option to attend residential school online but it was more extended period. It was 21 days, uh, 21 day residential school online, where students had to work on their case study uh, for a couple of hours a day. Uh, in the Russian, in Russian institution, which was partner institution of the UK of the UK University, uh, they were allowed to change the structure of the program and the delivery format for up to 70 for up to 25 percent. However, in real situation, it hasn't been changed, so it was not changed uh, uh, in any significant ways apart from additional 
residential meetings, uh, sorry, addi additional um, uh, teaching weekends. So there was a couple of teaching weekends during uh, each module. Uh, but in other, in other way, those programs can be seen as identical. So yeah, from, so from one perspective, my program can be seen as hybrid, but because I use the definition of Alan and Simon, I talk about online programs. Okay, thanks Olga. And I think we've probably got time for this one last question, which I think is, 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 is a really important one. It comes from Catherine. And uh, she says it was a very complex theoretical framework. So she's so her question is, I think this is this is a this is a very good question for you. How did you avoid getting lost or overwhelmed by it? I think uh, uh, I agree with Catherine. It's a very complex theoretical framework, but uh, conceptual framework was even more complicated. Uh, and in fact, uh, I did not have any theoretical framework. I had theoretical um, you know, concepts brought into the uh, stage of discussion. Uh, so how I followed, how I was able to, uh, to follow and maintain it, I think my academic, um, pro academic blog helped me when I was reflecting and documenting step by step what I was doing. So it not only helped me to structure and uh, you know, I like structuring. I liked when it's all nicely explained and it's all visible what you are doing step by step. Uh, and it helped me to uh, to see in my head for me when I when I was actually writing it down to see what I'm doing and how I'm applying different frameworks layer by layer. And in fact, if I won't be if I won't explain that, I still have to do that. So all phenomenographers do apply frameworks, they do apply analytical frameworks, but not many of them have, again, maybe chance or maybe space to describe how they use it. They actually focused on, out, on describing outcome space. While in my doctoral research, and I don't know if it's good to say it or not, I'm not interested in, in the uh, findings as such, which are very interested, interesting by itself, although they're not generalizable, I'm interested in how we can use different approaches to dig deeper and to get a better understanding of something by using uh, different frameworks. So in short, you need to document um, your process of doing something and applying those frameworks and this will help you to keep it on track. Okay, thanks very much for that, Olga. So, um, uh, other comments uh, from uh, Hirano to, to, to say very interesting and informative um, and from Faith uh, also informative and interesting and Biliana says super helpful and interesting and thanks you very much uh, and uh, thank you from Samuel um, and many thanks for a wonderful presentation from John and thanks also from Faith um, and from um, Len um and from Catherine and from Chris uh and from Sally and from Tahani um okay so um and then Sally asks uh, where you can find uh, where she can find or where anyone can find uh, your blog and i think that's probably um that's probably listed is it somewhere in terms of where the blog is available uh, I only put a couple of articles, publications from my blog onto the education research uh, blog, but I keep my blog uh, because it's, it has a lot of um, um, sensitive data and some data, you know, my, my personal reflection, I keep it uh, closed. It's not publicly available. However, if people are really interested, so I need to kind of polish it a bit and to take some very personal reflection out and uh, uh, polish a little bit and maybe probably I will make it available after after thesis um, after the Viva because there are a lot of valuable information a lot of step-by-step uh, uh, -step guidance it was for myself mainly how you can do it and what what are the points of reflection when you can enter yourself when you can you know deep yourself so I think I will make it available later but for now I need to work on it a little bit Okay, so thanks, thanks very much for that, Olga. Um, and the, 
Um, the thanks continue to come in, but I'll, I'll have to allow you to, to look at those after because of the time and, and our needing to, to close things up. But uh, in closing this, can I, can I thank everyone who's been involved? You've been a wonderful audience uh, involved. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Dee, Catherine, Kyungmi and Rebecca. Um, without your support and background, this seminar series would not happen and the running of these sessions would not be possible. Um, and Olga, um, everyone is thanking you and I'd also like to thank you for a really fine presentation and your willingness to take so many, so many questions. Um, you, before before we say um, cheerio to everybody, I just want to announce that the next online seminar is on, on the 10th of June. And this will be presented by Catherine Stapleford, who's a PhD student at Lancaster. And the title is Navigating the Distances of Online Learning. So we retain um, a focus on online learning. And now um, I'd like to uh, unmute everyone and ask you to wow. thank Olga in the usual way. Well done, Olga. Whoop, 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 whoop. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.